Hi, I'm Terry Blackwell, so I'm going to put on my behavior analyst hat for a second. Uh, the presentation that you just saw by Jimmy and Vivian, I, I want to speak to a little bit because I've, I spent much of my life as a clinician. Um, and think back to Stephen here and Jimmy teaching him how to request things. Looked kind of simple, didn't it? Just hold something out and ask. I got to tell you, having been there and tried that, good luck. It's a very, very high level of skill with somebody who has a 25-year history of spitting in the face to be able to get in, identify when the motivation is specific, and have them ask for something. And yet that, that simple and incredibly complex thing changes lives. So I asked Jimmy to run this for a second because I want to ask you a question before he runs it. Steven's a scary looking guy, right? He's a scary guy. Just Could you run this, Jim? Okay, thanks. And if you can go to the presentation on RBT. So the reason that I showed that is I got a question. I have a question for everybody who's sitting here. What is the value of Stephen's life? Is that answer different if this is your son or your brother? Unfortunately, Stephen and many people like him still live in places called developmental centers. So the example that Vivian showed you, she didn't talk about some numbers, but I think Saul is right on top of my lead-in to the registered behavioral tech credential. That lady, Nama, that was in the video, I had moved into an administrative capacity at Services for the Underserved, and we began to take a look at Nama and what she was costing the New York State Department of Health. And the number was pretty incredible. She had hospitalizations happen. I think her original rate of headbanging was about 1,000 per day. Think about that, 1,000 headbangs a day. She had been in the state's facility care for years, costing basically about 20, two, I'm going to say $250,000 per person per year. Nama was a star. That was exclusive of the hospital bills. Sometimes she would break the skin. Sometimes she'd be admitted. And there were real things going on. Now, the state of New York dedicated tremendous resources to Nama's custodial care. And I use that word custodial very, very carefully. It wasn't bad people doing bad things. It was people who did not have the technology or the knowledge to change her life. And then Nama got incredibly fortunate. Vivian came along with a fellow by the name of Dr. Brian Iwata with the basic premise that human behavior can be shaped. And towards the end of Nama's treatment and the clip that you saw of her having a relationship with another human being, not headbanging, talking about a future, what was the value of that in numeric terms to the state of New York? Well, we ran the numbers. Nama today is basically walking dogs for a living. She's not hitting the emergency room. When she headbangs from time to time, it's not with severity to break the skin. And we ran that number out because it was legitimate that she would be in the system for another 20 years. That was $24 million the state saved by just giving us treatment money for that one woman for one year. $24 million, one woman, one year. What was the difference? The difference was to look through the lens of applied behavior analysis. So my presentation today is, and the consistent theme here is, how can we use ABA to alter the destinies of the people that we serve? If you are a parent of a kid who's 10 or 12 or 14, the good and challenging news is the day is coming when they will be 22. What will be the tools that you will have to be able to help your own kid? <coughs> so. We have the use of ABA and applied behavior analysis and the registered behavioral tech credential. So the RBT is the newest credential, and I have to give substantial credit to Jimmy over here for helping me pull this together. It's a dry topic, right, because we're going to go over a lot of the things that are just, this is what you got to do, this is when you got to do it, this is how you have to be supervised. I interspersed it with a few comments um, to frame it. And I, I think Stephen and the conversation about the value to the field of human services and education of this credential are right on point. And so I'm going to tell some stories to interject and make it a more palatable presentation for the next 
45 minutes until you get to go eat, and that, that'll be your reinforcer. The use of a credential that is not professionally licensed is not a new concept, right? Anybody do special ed in the audience? Maybe that's a good, good assessment. How many here are BCBAs? Show of hands. Pretty good showing. RBTs. Okay, a couple of folk parents. Ernest, you're in. Okay, right? So in classrooms, we have these special ed teachers, typically a master's level. Who are the other people in the classroom that do an awful lot of the work? Teacher's aides, right? It's a standard design. I think that the RBT was a brilliant, brilliant idea of the Behavior Analyst Certification Board. Why do I think that? You know, I already have this BCBA. Shouldn't everybody have a BCBA? Well, that would be great if we didn't have this thing going on with autism and developmental disabilities that's just kind of tracking up and there's not sufficient capacity to provide services. The other thing that I, I mentioned here, we're right down the road from probably the best behavior services unit in the world, Kennedy Krieger Institute. Kennedy Krieger, if you have a kid with very, very severe problem behavior, chances are Christmas is getting your kid into that institution because some of the best clinicians in the world work there. What's the challenge with that admission if you're a parent, let's say, of a 10-year-old who's very, very severely aggressive? What happens when the hospitalization insurance runs out? There's a whole lot more people out in the general community than there are in institutions. And in fact, there are very, very few institutions like Kennedy Krieger left out there. So the ability to step somebody down from an acute care or an inpatient setting to a generalized setting known typically as home is very, very difficult if you can't embed the technology, technology meaning applied behavior analysis, with the people who are going to live with that person. And I believe that the RBT gives a very, very good opportunity for parents to engage the technology to be able to carry over the treatment that you saw Vivian and Jimmy delivering so well. So the focus of my presentation today is on how can we use the RBT credential both to revitalize human services and education. Last night I had a conversation that's the other side of a dialogue that Saul was touching upon, which had to do with living wage for the staff that work in our human service programs. Now, could I also get a show of hands? How many folks here work in human services? Mm, so probably half. When I started off in the field a thousand years ago, and there were pterodactyls flying around over the, you know, in the skies, <coughs> we got paid a hot $10,500 to be a direct care staff. There's a difference today, though, because when I was making $10,500, I was able to do a couple of things. I could put gas in my car, I could pay my rent, and I might even be able to afford to go out and get a beer on a Friday night. Today, our staff are working two and three jobs in residential and day programs because we're paying a wage that they can't live on. And that's a potential disaster for the field of human services. It's not sustainable. In fact, I ran a little number before I came in. $10,500 in 1980 today is equivalent to $32,000, which is about a third more than most of our staff are paid at the entry level. So the RBT working with a behavior analyst creates data sets that show the impact of working with applied behavior analysis. There is nothing that convinces a funding source better than data that shows effectiveness. In fact, where's Natalie? You're out there, I know it. We were having a conversation during the break about working with people who have to pay for services, typically known as government entities. One of the things that's going to be required and is in required more and more frequently is what's known as an evidence-based practice. Now, my understanding from, of, from New York State Education, their criteria for an evidence-based practice is it had to be scientifically validated, it had to be published and reviewed by peers. Now, there are peers who have reviewed the RBT credential and say, no, 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 you shouldn't be doing this. It's a horrible idea. I'm not one of those guys. I think there's always critics. They usually don't put up statues for critics. I believe that this particular credential is very applicable in terms of developing competencies in the workplace and also for parents, quite frankly, that want to carry this stuff over at home. So to me, it's a breath of fresh air. Many, many millennia ago, when I was in graduate school, 
ABA was called learning theory. Is there anybody here other than Saul old enough to remember that? And learning theory was the big deal back then. It was called behavior modification. It was in, we had magazines back then rather than the internet. You know, these were these things with little pictures on the cover. And behavior mod was everywhere. If I went back and I did a search of what was going on with behavior modification, whether it was Time Magazine, Newsweek, Life Magazine, all of them were talking about the science of applied behavior analysis. Educators, we effectively owned the world. If you were a behavior analyst, you were in good shape back then. But something happened. We lost that position. I bring up one of the things that I heard for the first time a few years ago at a conference, precision teaching. Anybody here ever hear of precision teaching? How many schools do you know of that do precision teaching today? Here's the thing that kicked my butt. When I heard that we spent almost 30 years, I believe it was, and $10 billion with a B to find out working with inner city children, how can we get better results, scientifically validated better results. This all started with the Johnson administration and we know that the answer is precision teaching. So why don't we do it anywhere? Because it's hard and it takes time and it's got a horrible four letter word attached to it that teachers hate. Anybody know what that word is? Data is the correct answer. <laughs> right, data has this thing attached to it that particularly teachers unions don't enjoy. Anybody know what that is? Skinner asked a question. If you're teaching something, is the learner ever wrong? And if the learner's not wrong, what's the implication of that statement? The teacher might not be precisely on target, right? So data creates accountability. And that's okay, especially if you're looking for progress. Back in that period as well, ABA, under the title of behavior modification, was being used so wide, widely that there was a guy in the animal circles known as Bob Lilly, who was teaching dolphins to work with Navy SEALs. I mean, it was the stuff of daydreams. We owned the media, and then something happened. Our language was tough. Manding, anybody here ever hear of manding before? No. Skinner invented a whole language to discuss what he was doing. He could have said requesting. Might have made more sense if he was looking for generalization. And I put down here a kindergarten rule. We did not play well with others, right? How often BCBAs, well, there were no BCBAs back in the day, but the ABA genius would walk in and say, look, I have the data, this is what works, and you have to do it my way, because there is no other way, but my way is the way to do it. How does that go over when you walk into a room of teachers who are just enchanted to see your tie and jacket? Probably not so well. So it was a tremendous amount of effort, and the reinforcement by its nature was delayed, because you had to learn an awful lot to get to that reinforcement of seeing the behavioral changes through the analytics of the data. So where did the science go? So this is a segue to the Behavior An Analyst Certification Board. That's a mouthful in the morning, right? When I got out of graduate school, there was no BACB. Didn't know about it. If I'd have known about it, maybe I'd have participated or not. But what did the origin of that organization do? Well, it did a couple of things. Anybody ever seen the title behaviorist on staffing lists? I've seen it a lot. What's a behavior? I always say to people, you know what a behaviorist is? The guy who says hello to you when you walk into Walmart. He's a behaviorist. Right? He wants to make sure you're happy. He's seeking to change your behavior. But the vagaries before the Behavior Analyst Certification Board were there were no control titles. They were smart out of the gate. They trademarked and registered the BCBA and the BCABA, which is typically the assistant level who practices under a BCBA. There are both doctoral level BCBAs and master's level credentials. They established with some really, really smart guys, standards and practice guidelines. I'm gonna bet that Saul was involved in some of that. Right, so if you've taken the test, blame him. <laughs> and Florida became a real hot spot. I think a lot of the origins of the field emanated from the Florida ABA Association. So over time, behavior analysts start to promulgate and we get senior researchers and practitioners buying into it. The technology is still hard, 
but guidelines arise, such as an article that we were talking about on our learning collaborative, the guides, the right to effective treatment, which are still very, very important today, and really before that didn't exist. So about the Behavior Analyst Certification Board, for those of you who are board certified, you know a lot of this, came into existence in 1998. It is, in fact, a nonprofit under the IRS designation. It credentials behavior analysts, and I'm just going to read this bullet, meets professional credentialing needs identified by governments, consumers of behavior analysis services, and behavior analysts. The BACB certification requirements undergo a regular review according to international standards that grant professional credentials. And last but not least, all BCBA or BACB requirements are established by content, content experts in the field. Jimmy and I passed the BCBA exam a few years apart. He was practicing and very proficient in his practice. But I remember going in to take the BCBA, BCBA exam after locking myself away for about a month and a half studying. And I thought, when I got done with the test, actually that's where I saw Vivian first. It was a cute story. She was sitting kind of, it was one of these lecture classes, and we were taking the, the uh, test, I didn't know her, and you have a timed a period to take the test. And was, I think it was like, what, three or four hours? And so this woman in front of me had the nerve to fold her pamphlet up two hours into the exam. And I thought, well, maybe she's going to the bathroom, because I'm only about halfway through. <laughs> and then she picked up her purse. And I thought, well, maybe she's afraid somebody's going to steal her purse in the middle of this proctored exam. But then my head just about blew off when she handed in the test and said, thank you, and walked out the door. And this can't be. And then it turned out I got to find out who this crazy woman was, and she did pass the exam. <laughs> I remember thinking at the end of that exam, I didn't pass this exam. But as a parent, I'm OK with that. Because whoever can pass this exam wouldn't hurt my kid if they engaged my kid. So that's just kind of the non-data-driven assessment of what the Behavior Analyst Certification Board has created in terms of their rigor. Hmm, technology. So what is the mission of the BACB? To protect consumers of behavior analysis services by systemically establishing, promoting, and disseminating standards. The global vision is to solve a wider variety of socially significant problems by increasing the availability of qualified behavior analysts around the world and the core values as an international nonprofit standard setting organization, the BACB is responsive, data driven, and accountable. Which is a long winded way of saying, let's make sure that the representation of the practice in the field is done in such a manner that parents, consumers of, ser of services, can expect and obtain consistent results when they engage behavior analysts. There are some nightmare stories out there. For those of you who are parents, this one won't surprise you. In central New Jersey, down by the Toms River Aquifer, we were talking about it today a little bit, um, Vince Carbone was working with Jimmy at the time, came into the area known as Brick Township. Well, the Center for Disease Control had put up a report online that said that Brick Township was affected by the water in the Toms River Aquifer. Toms River Aquifer. With, if, you'd have to almost know the geography to make sense of it. It was the area when New York City 100 years ago had to dump all their trash, including all their heavy metals. You drove it about 70 miles out of town and you dumped it in this place, Tom's River, which was down the Jersey, towards the Jersey Shore. Well, the outbreak and incidence there of autism was so intense, there was absolutely no capacity to meet the need of children with autism. So I remember about 10 years ago reading a newspaper article back in the day when there were such things as newspapers. And it was about a woman who held herself out to a family as a licensed psychologist and a BCBA. Well, there weren't a whole lot of BCBAs around 10 years ago, or actually probably about half of what there are today. So it was kind of strange, because nobody had ever heard of this woman. Well, the article was about how a judge had sentenced her to four, five years, four or five years in jail, tough jail, Rahway State, because she had deceived the family that she was an autism expert and had billed them almost $100,000 a year for the preceding four or five years. Before the family got wise and kind of had educated themselves, well, where's the data that we should be looking at? Where's the graphs of progress? Where's the reduction? And when they actually called in somebody to investigate, this woman had bilked dozens and dozens of families. The Behavior Analyst Certification Board runs a website that that parent could have just gone in, typed in their 
typed in their zip code, and looked up whether or not this person was board certified. But instead, four years of their child's life was sold to somebody who didn't know what they were doing. Accreditation, this is a big deal. All certification programs are accredited by the National Commission for Certification, NCCA is out of DC, they're serious. BCBA has been accredited since 2007, and I'm gonna jump down to the RBT since 2016. So we're here to talk about the RBT, Registered Behavior Tech. It's pretty new. What are the different credentials? You've got a doctoral level credential, such as Saul holds, Kaori holds, Lois. And then you've got the master's level, so that would be Vivian, Jimmy, and myself, for examples. The BCABA, there was a period of time when in God's sense of humor, I was supervising Jimmy and Vivian because they had the little a in between their name until they took the big test and got the big BCBA. And then the behavior tech. Now the behavior tech is something to think about because it can be used in a lot of different ways. That, that top line is a very non-ABA term, mindfulness. Right? There are considerations in my mind of the use of this credential that exceed far beyond having to implement it the way that it was designed. As an example, there are a lot of people up in the Hudson Valley in New York who do home instruction. Some of those kids are actually special ed kids who need additional services and have behavior problems. Well, does a parent really need, if they're doing home instruction, to go get supervised by Vivian for X number of hours a week to be able to implement the principles of ABA in the instruction of their child? I guess it's, that's their call. In a group home, uh, such as one that Viv was helping us with, where we've got several people who need some structured teaching, do all of those staff have to get their RBT? Or can they use the principles? Now, there may be embedded within those individuals people who say, you know, this is a kind of a nice idea. If I get my RBT, I can work on insurance cases, meaning cases where an individual who has the RBT can work under the supervision of a BCBA in the delivery of services to an individual with typically autism or some other disability. What are some other uses? Educators who want to enhance their instructional impact, whether that's a teacher at the bachelor's level, master's level, teacher's aide. Right now, and I'll, I'll get into it in a little bit, there was a decision by the Supreme Court that was a unanimous decision back on March 22, 2017. It was a really big deal. I believe over the next 10 years it's going to change the face of special education. And I'll get into the why on that. But think about it. When was the last time you heard of the Supreme Court unanimously voting on anything? Well, they unanimously decided that the way that we deal with kids in special ed should not be what they call de minimis. We shouldn't be warehousing kids. We should actively and aggressively be seeking progress, which raises a very interesting question. If you don't measure progress, how do you know it's there? And what other method has anybody come across to measure educational progress? School administrators, I put this one on the bottom being a school principal in New York. There is a lot of time and effort and energy spent defending litigation. How much simpler if you simply decided that you were going to go to the rigor of ABA to actually collect data on progress on the kids in your classes? Right now, if you were to talk to most school administrators, they would tell you that probably 20 to 20 to 25, 30% of their time is spent in consideration of how are we going to defend ourselves against such and such parent or such and such attorney. Now, I've been kind of I don't know that impressed is the right word, but I've kind of been surprised down in the central Atlantic area that there are not such, there are like no attorneys that you can go down the block to a special ed administrator and say, excuse me, I have a kid in my program, he's not getting what he needs from his district, can you tell me the name of the lawyer that when the child study team hears their name, they want to throw up a little bit? When you ask that question in New Jersey and New York, you get an answer like that. Down here, Joe Gannon and I have been seeking that holy grail of an attorney who's very aggressive about the rights and the rights to effective treatment. Ernest, you got that name? All 
All right, you see that guy sitting right down below you? He's the agency's attorney, so give that, and he's also a doctorate in education. He needs that name. <laughs> and last but not least, I put in here, under special education, there's something called related services. And so I, I, I'm a loner on this one, but I think the treatment team, whatever that looks like, occupational therapists, speech pathologists, PTs, OTs, nursing, could benefit from the educational component of the RBT. Not saying that they want to go back and become RBTs, but if they had the education, the ability to interface when Vivian's working with someone and not accidentally reinforce them based on the function of the behavior would be tremendously valuable. I had a dream. <laughs> so consideration, I did get into a little bit of the review of that Supreme Court decision. It's the case of Andrew, E-N-D-R-E-W, versus the Douglas County School District. The family basically came to court and said to the court, look, our kid's being warehoused. The same exact thing you're telling us is wrong with him and that you're gonna take, take care of in first grade, we're having this conversation in fifth grade and he's not making any progress. You're not showing us any data, you're not showing us that he's getting better, and it's simply unacceptable and inappropriate. Well, what did the court say about this? First of all, they were unanimous in their decision and they use the term that an IEP, which is the Individual Education Plan, must be appropriate, appropriately ambitious. That's, think about what that term means, because there's gonna be a lot of lawyers thinking about what that term means over the next few years. Appropriately ambitious, and it must be specific to the individual child, so that the IEP is reasonably calculated to enable the child to make progress. Again, back to the question, how can you document that the child made prog progress and that the IEP was appropriately ambitious if you're not measuring baseline treatment outcome? And last but not least, we have a graph of the credentials by the numbers. So here's who's out there today. The doctoral level BCBAs, and I'm gonna move out of the way for folk. There's about 2,000 doctoral level BCBAs. Many of those folks are psychologists and also members of the APA. Then there's the BCBA at the master's level, 22,000, call it 22,500, and the BCABA, which is really typically a bachelor's level credential that has to practice under the BCBA. Now keep in mind the date that I shared with you about the creation of the RBT credential. What was that date, anybody? 2016, so a hot year later, there's 28,000 RBTs. That's a really big deal. So the graph in a different form. This RBT credential obviously has grown, and I, I don't know that the, anybody could anticipate that level of growth that quickly. Probably the issue that will be most pressing for the behavior analyst board over time is the appropriate supervision of that credential, right, and keeping tight quality controls. Guess who that falls on today? Whoever is the board certified behavior analyst is attaching their license, some states license, some, some states the national is certification, but if I sign off that Mark is a registered behavior tech functioning under me, my license is attached to his practice of the implementation of the behavior plans that I have to create. So I think it's a really good thing. I think it's a great thing for the time. The need for individuals to have effective treatment that is documented through an evidence-based practice is far outpacing the creation of new BCBAs. There are a lot of them but there are states that you can look at. I was just talking to a parent this morning who said when she was in Washington state, there was only 50 in the entire state. I remember my wife picking out the BACB map and looking in Hawaii at one point had a hot 12. I thought, yeah, it's a nice place to move. It's nice and warm out there. I'm sure there's more than 12 now. My opinion is that the registered behavior tech RBT is a well thought out and controlled effort on the part of the behavior analyst board to bring a robust technology to the masses in a coherent and monitored fa fashion. There are detractors, we'll talk about those a little bit, but typically, those are not the people that are in the trenches. Um, we were having a conversation last evening at dinner and we had the honor to work with Dr. Iwata, who's pretty, pretty heavyweight in the field of ABA. And he's kind of an impeccable clinician, right? He's really driven for excellence in his data, his research and his reporting. 
And Jimmy and I were on a very long, hot, if I remember, van ride. It, has no air, it had no air conditioning that day for whatever reason. And we had just come from a group home, actually the developmental center in Brooklyn. And we were talking about the application of the science in community settings. And what he said was pretty critical to me was, you know, I, I realize when we come out and we come back from these places, you guys are dealing with all sorts of variables. Staff turnover, you know, staff not showing up. Staff essentially saying, I'm in a union, I don't have to do what you tell me to do, right? Facility issues, all these other variables that are very, very controlled when you're in a clinic, but out in the community, you don't have that much control. The only control you have is over your clinical discipline. So here is the growth of the credentials by the numbers over time. And as you can see, things are spinning up rather rapidly. BCABAs, credentials, number and growth of RBTs. This graph to me indicated that there was a tremendous demand for the credential. It was actually created earlier, it was certified in 2016, but you can see that out of the gate there was a pent up desire for folks to go out and get some sort of designation that they knew that, that what they were doing. And so uh, I'll tell a story related to this because otherwise just the numbers and the graphs get a little boring. Years ago, Vivian and I met, well actually I met a mom coming off of the school bus with a kid who was a big human being. I get big human being. This kid was about this tall, but he was the front line of the Green Bay Packers at the age of a hot, maybe he was 10. And mom was taking him, she was a school bus driver, taking him by the hand, and it was at the special ed administrative building in the school district I grew up in actually. And I was kinda, it was the middle of the school day, it was unusual, um, and she was going to meet with the director and I was meeting with the director. So the director had con contrived an opportunity to kinda tweak me a little bit. Said, I'd like you to meet um, Mrs. J, and this is her son, Francisco. I said, oh, okay. She says, he hasn't been in school for three years. I said, well, how old is he? She said, well, he's eight. I said, is he? yeah, and she, well, he's almost nine but he hasn't been in school for three years. I said, well, how could that be? She said, well, let me tell you a story about what happened. She said he went to a class and uh, they were putting some demands on him and he was a nonverbal kid. Um, but very quickly, I was kind of playing some of the games that Jimmy was playing in terms of testing things out. He was able to pick up signs very quickly, one of which was go home, leave me alone, big man. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I listened to this story, the nightmare story of the mother saying, look, you know, he, he in my language, inadvertently reached across to get back, to get the teacher out of his face and he accidentally scratched her retina. So he was put on home instruction because he injured a teacher. So the next, next year they bring him back into September and I believe at that point he was either in first or second grade and they have him go into an instructional environment which is oh so much fun after you've been in kindergarten, right, the children's garden to let's read academics and do math now, it's all good. And what happens? He has a teacher who's wearing, anyone? Glasses. And he's not sure, but there's some conditioning that was rather strongly reinforced by a year at home with mom playing video games. And this time he does reach out and he does damage. He really scratches the teacher's eyes or the teacher's eye. He goes out, there's no chance this kid's coming back and he's, he's labeled as a very, he's, he's a tough kid, he's Steven, right? Third year they send him, what do you do when you can't serve a kid in district? because he's dangerous, you send them away to somebody else's district. So, you know, just because the sense of humor of the universe, he goes to the new school, he's now pretty sure how he gets to go home, and what's the third teacher wearing? And so that's how he ends up, he's not in school for a while. So, Vivian and I get involved, and I, and I basically, it was one of these sales pitch things, I said, look, we got this kid, he's a tank but I think he has the capacity to learn relatively quickly communication stuff. And if I'm not mistaken, he's probably got this function going on where he wants what he wants where he wants it, which in the fancy language is, right, socially mediated positive, or when you ask me to do something, I've learned if I scratch your eye, you go away, right, escape maintained. We implemented a program that really, at the end of the day, you know, she, she was very, very good on the adaptive side. I was kind of the guy, get down and give me 20 from the Marine Corps. And the combination of that, we were able to get a little bit of a reduction right out of the gate on the severe problem behavior. But the people who today would be called behavior techs had to be wearing cardiac face shields. Do you remember that? I mean, this was, we were going, we were doing battle. I gotta tell you, if we hadn't had, I think it was five total, five people, 
who would today be registered behavior techs, that kid would still be out of, he'd still not be at home. He'd probably be in a hospital ward somewhere tranquilized because you see, you know, the label had been already attached to him at an early age. This kid was a monster. The district did the right thing and gave us a few years to work with him. Um, and it was an expensive protocol, but I always come back and I say, compared to what? Compared to that family losing a son or having a son put away in a ward somewhere, being tranquilized with intramuscular injections, I don't think it was so expensive. The family stays in touch with both Vivian and I from time to time. I get a Christmas card every year of this kid and his brother. And I gotta tell you, it goes up on the wall of fame. Because that's the example of the power of this technology in use. That was an insolvable equation. Not because the very, very nice people in the district didn't want to help, they didn't know how to help. And so without those RBTs, we would not have been able to move. So the RBT is a para, paraprofessional who practices under the close ongoing supervision of a BCBA or a BCABA. And this is the key, the primary responsibility is for the direct implementation of behavior analytic services. The RBT does not, underline does not, design interventions or assessment pl or plans. Somehow the typing cut it off, assessments or plans. So if you're here and you're, you're coming, I know there's a couple of people here who talked about maybe becoming an RBT. The RBT permits you to implement the plans that are based on functional assessments of the BCBAs. So you won't be doing the assessments and you won't be writing the plans. You can help inform the writing of the plans but your job as an RBT is the actual implementation. What are the requirements? And this is the, the dry portion, so I'm gonna read you the same stuff you got in your handouts. You must be 18 years of age, have a high school diploma or a national equivalent, which I thought was kind of smart, successfully complete a criminal background check at the time of application, complete a 40-hour online or otherwise training program conducted by a BACB certificate, and it comes off of a task list. So there's not a whole lot of surprises going on here. You're told up front, look, this is the stuff you're gonna have to know, and you're gonna have to go through this competency-based 40-hour education, and then we're gonna test you to make sure that you're not gonna hurt anybody if you go to work with them. Sound reasonable? Sound difficult? Probably. Compared, again, compared to what? So what is the RBT task list? This list includes the core tasks likely to be, be performed by behavior techs. It covers tasks that a behavior tech will perform with some, and I'm gonna say almost never with all clients. And there are different areas for this. Measurement, assessment, well, didn't I just say you can't do a functional assessment? Yeah, this is a different one. This relates to the assessment of, of the measurements you've been taking. Skill acquisition and behavior reduction. So in the world of ABA, that's called the fair pair. If I wanna reduce a behavior, how do I increase the adaptive side of that behavior? I don't know that it's always possible. Saul may be, might know that, but not always, but 99.9% .9 like ivory soap. Documentation and reporting and professional conduct and scope of practice. 